first piece of live action on the arena this afternoon, and this is a World War II battle scenario. Uh, I'm going to ask you to try and remove yourselves from sunny Dorset back to uh, central Germany in March 1945. The Red Army is pushing in from the east and they are knocking on the door of Berlin up on the Zadar Heights. And Operation Varsity has put the Allies across the Rhine and they are pushing down into the centre of Germany. There are still active German units uh, and see one just approaching from the left hand side of the arena. This is what we call a Kampfgruppe and these are pretty well ad hoc formations. Most of the regular formations have been destroyed, reformed and the Kampfgruppe, the core of this is uh, men from the 304th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, uh, augmented by an anti-tank detachment. They are under orders to locate and support a Hetzer, which is a tank destroyer, uh, which is hull down over in the wood block over on the right hand side of the arena. So they're moving on through. The lead vehicle is an SB-32-222, uh, and that's the kind of firefighter. That is the commissary vehicle, so it's lightly armoured. It's all-wheel drive, it's got a 3.8 metre pepper engine. So it's quick, but it's lightly armoured. Behind the 222 is an SB-32-251. These are better known as the Panamag from the factory that produced them. And this is, well, putting it in simple terms, it's a battle taxi. So it's got a crew of two, it's an armoured vehicle, uh, up to 15 millimetres of armour on the front. But the most important thing there is it's carrying 10 Panzer Grenadiers. Uh, and these are tough, elite infantry. The Panzer Grenadier is a World War II uh, German term. Up to the start of World War II, there were no Panzer Grenadiers, they were just termed mechanised infantry. Um, but they came to the conclusion they needed infantry to work in cooperation with armour. And that's how the elite Panzer Grenadier formations were formed. Now behind that, there is a um, heavy truck. That is probably a piece of so that's a pack 38. Uh, it's a little bit elderly by this point of war. Uh, it's a 50mm anti-tank gun. Uh, it's a towed anti-tank gun. And in just a moment, you'll see the Panzer Grenadier dismounting and they're going to have to manhandle that piece of ordnance into position. This is the disadvantage of towed anti-tank. Uh, it requires a lot of buggy about. I mean, that thing weighs a couple of tons, and they're going to have to unhitch it, push it into position, and then spread the trail so that they're ready to fire. Behind, uh, bringing up the rear is another SDK I've said 222. If you look at them, uh, there's a bit of a difference here. Uh, the one at the lead is battle worn, very not too bad. The one at the rear is uh, in pretty much squeaky being clean condition. And we believe it's been uh, by a Volkswagen Deer unit. Up to this point, it hasn't seen any action. It's been stashed away in the shed. first time. Now, as I said, the camp group of commander is under orders to locate and support the Hetzer. The Hetzer itself, which will appear very shortly, that is a yard panzer. It's a tank plot. It's built on a 35T Czech light tank chassis uh, mounting a 75mm gun. And the camp group of commander that's an asset that the Wehrmacht can't afford to lose. It's separated from its main formation. Uh, Camp Uganda is under orders to find and support and extract the Hetzer. Now, if you watch all the activity at the back of that heavy truck, you can see the Camp Commander has decided that he's not in a position to move on immediately, so they're going to lay an ambush, rear guard action. They realise that pressing on their heels is an American formation and they're going to try and spring an ambush. So they're manoeuvring the Pack 38 into position, into its firing position, and shortly the Panzer Grenadier will take up uh, position using available cover wherever they can. 
If you look up on the uh, man at the back, you can see the two of them are actually deployed already. Uh, they have an MG42. That is a very potent uh, machine gun. 1,200 rounds a minute. Uh, the Allies call it Hitler's buzzsaw. Uh, in fact, 1,200 rounds a minute, if you think about it, it's a bit wasteful. You're killing everything 10 times. You're using a lot of ammunition. But it nonetheless is a very, very potent weapon. The heavy truck is backing away, getting out of the field of fire. And the two, like the Panthers have taken flank positions, so they should be able to use their two centimeter cannon. This is the nervous making part of planning an ambush. You're in position. Um, they haven't been able to dug in, they haven't had to dig in, they haven't had the time, but they are in position and they're waiting for the enemy to appear. The idea is, let the enemy come to you. When it's in range, deliver maximum killing firepower. But there's no guarantee you're going to play your game. There's no guarantees actually going to come um, along the axis you had plotted. And he might be coming around the side, he might be able to flank you, he might be hit from the rear. So uh, this part of the ambush scenario is very nervous making. There's also another piece of German ordnance on the field. You can see one of the Panzer Grenadieren is going forward with a Panzer Schreck. This is the German equivalent of the bazooka. It's an anti-tank weapon and it's reasonably potent, although you do have to get into very, very close range, uncomfortably close range for a live tank. And then preferably hit it into the armor's tennis, which is going to be what we call a spot and hit down the side, or into the tracks with the mobile. Going up against the tank for an infantryman is a very, very hairy business. Now they didn't have long to wait because the US recon unit is hard on their heels. They're coming forward. They have been directed to find and fix this enemy formation. So they're being pushed on by their fire command. Uh, they are now moving forward. They're led by an M8 Greyhound. That's an armored car. It's a 6x6 uh, armored car. Relatively thinly armored. It's designed as a recce vehicle. So reconnaissance vehicles, you're not supposed to, supposed to go and take them, but you're not really supposed to get into a scrap. If you're in a recce vehicle, Rounds clanging off the outside, the top side, you have done something wrong. The Greyhound is coming forward. There is a turret with 37 mm gun in it, uh, but that's really, as I said, it's sort of a defensive uh, situation. Then, isn't it? The British Army, incidentally, didn't really rate the Greyhound. They thought it's, it was underpowered, its off road performance wasn't great, um, and they also thought it was vulnerable to mines because it had thin belly arm. Behind the Greyhound is the command jeep. And then behind that, a dock weapons carrier. The ambush has been sprung. We're going to shoot into the US radio net with a lot of radio traffic. The Americans have slightly been caught napping there. Their two soft vehicles, Dodge and Jeep, have been knocked out. The troops in those vehicles haven't had no choice at all. They've had to pick up their small arms, their personal weapons, and retreat from their down there, stuck in the middle. Now, the Chaffee light tank, the M24, which had accompanied them, is coming forward. But I don't know whether he fancies mis mixing it with an anti-tank gun. He's got a 75mm gun in that turret, but he is a recce vehicle, lightly armoured, though the chassis is got better on it. He doesn't want to mix it with an anti-tank gun, much less a Hetzer, so he is pulling back. The commander of the Greyhound, who has 
pulled off to one side, he will be on this big powerful radio set and he will be calling up reinforcements. This is too much for the refugee group to take on. They're going to need to bring up some more armour from the column that's following. So that's effectively the ambush sprung and it's round one for the Wehrmacht, round one for the Panzer Grenadiers. Reinforcements are arriving. You can see there's a Sherman approaching the position of Greyhound. The Sherman, the M4A1, uh, you'll see a lot more of Shermans a little bit later on. The Sherman is the second most prolific tank of World War II. Around about 50,000 were produced. It is not designed to tangle with heavy enemy armour. It's got a 75mm gun, but it was really designed as an infantry support tank. Comes up against something like a tiger, the Sherman is going to come off worse. The Sherman is using his main armour, he's firing in the direction of the enemy position. The Chaffee is coming forward, also firing. The Chaffee is manoeuvring around behind the Sherman, taking advantage of the Sherman's better armour. We now have a standoff with the two Allied tanks pushing forward. Germans fire. The pack gun is firing back. Panzerfeld firing. Chaffee is manoeuvring position, trying to get an arc so they can get a shot in. You have to sort of suspend a little bit of disbelief here, ladies and gents, uh, because of course this is an arena situation. These engagements would be taking place many hundreds of yards apart if this were real warfare. Panzer Grenadierum are staying put in their position there, facing down the Allied armour. The SD Curve 222 is firing. He's not going to do much with a two centimetre gun, but he's obviously determined how to try. He is pulling forward. This is either a very brave, very foolhardy move on behalf of the 222 commander. He's pulling forward, he's firing. are shifting positions to counter this allied threat. But we have rounds dropping on joint position. The Chaffee and the Sherman have decided this is too much for them to cope with. Especially as the Hetzer has now made an appearance. That really is bad news for the allied army. Lots of rounds cracking across the battlefield. Allied armour has pulled back and they are awaiting further reinforcements. Suffering just dropping rounds down into the enemy position. US infantry moving in to secure the position. We 
talking about final defenders. U.S. infantry are securing the position. Prisoners are being marched off. The end of the war is not far off. And hopefully they're off to the happy Ladies and gentlemen, that was a terrific display. Titan Bridge layer approaching the riverbank and deploying the number 10 bridge under the cover of an artillery barrage and direct fire from government forces. Titan deploying the number 10 bridge uh, with a span of 26 meters. It can be launched in under two minutes. You can also operate the number 12 bridge, uh, which has a span of 30 and a half minutes, and that takes around 90 seconds to deploy, although it can carry two of these. bridges, uh, a greater gap can be uh, crossed. Even a special adapter, the bridge can uh, cross rivers up to five metres in depth and with a, a high tidal flow. As mentioned earlier, uh, the Titan is based on the Challenger 2 chassis with a slight modification. This allows it to take any adaptations made from a Challenger 2 hull, such as uh, exploiting new armor technologies. It also works in conjunction with the uh, Trojan and the Terrier in the armor engineering role. This is Echo 11 Golf. Bridge is set and crossing is now open. Over. Is it open? I'm watching the next phase of the operation. 
Entering arena now is the Jackal. This is a reconnaissance platform that will race ahead of the rest of the battlefield and create something called the reconnaissance gap. This means a gap of approximately five kilometers between the reconnaissance vehicles and the lead elements of the battlefield. This gap creates breathing space around the battlefield and that will form into the battlefield if the enemy is sighted. The Jackal will use a superior speed and stealth to get to the position of Overwatch on the enemy position. If an enemy is spotted, then a sighting report will be sent up to the battlefield commander. From here, the battery commander will take information from the reconnaissance call signs and formulate a plan. In this example, a deliberate attack. This plan will be disseminated across the battle group so all platforms understand the mission and their part to play in the plan. When the HR arrives, the battle group commander orders the attack. Hello, Charlie Charlie 1. This is 2 Alpha HR 1 in 3, 2, 1, go, go, go. The first vehicle of attack is the assaulting tanks. Their job is pure shock action. They drive towards the enemy, causing as much damage and destruction as possible, concentrating their fire on enemy armoured vehicles and defensive positions. Push off the flanks to provide fire support. Now it's the time for the armoured infantry. Mounting their warrior infantry fighting vehicles, the armoured infantry guided onto the position by the intimate support tanks, clear the objective of any remaining enemy forces. Their 30mm cannon made quick work of enemy infantry fighting vehicles, reconnaissance vehicles, and dug in enemy. The warrior now carries out its primary role, delivering its infantry right on top of the enemy position. The infantry call signs dismount and carry out a section attack with the warrior acting as fire support. The section commander takes charge and assaults the enemy position. One foot on the ground, there's always people on the ground putting suppressors fire while the attack is going. Once the position has been cleared, the infantry call signs can either remount the warrior or push back into an in-depth position.
from here, the battle group will recall. The Titan will either pick up the bridge or pick up a separate bridge to deliver to it. The battle group will then go through a rearming and refueling process, getting the battle group ready for the next attack. Driving it like you stole it.